Pastor Anaba and I have known each other for many, many years, and I have preached at their great church, Fountain Gate Chapel, in Bogotonga, West Africa, Ghana, West Africa. In their network of churches, churches that have been birthed out of the church in Bogotonga, there's 230 churches that have been birthed and have been established through the years of his ministry. I think we need to give God praise for that. He has stayed faithful to this region of Ghana, which is not the easiest part of the country to build ministry and to do things in. Uh, a lot of the, to be honest about it, as he has conveyed to me, a lot of the highly gifted or highly talented ended up leaving that part of the country going to the capital or going to other countries in Europe. And so God commissioned him to stay in that area. And from that area, which has been difficult turf at different times, he has worked diligently and has seen so many ministries raised up. But then, obviously, 230 churches established in that network from the birthing that has come from this ministry. God has brought them through many, many things. I know that you remember the loss of their daughters that happened several years ago. But I've never seen Bishop Anaba waver in his commitment to the kingdom of God or to his people at his church or to the many churches and pastors and leaders that look to him as a covering and as an overseer. In the midst of heartache and tragedy, they pressed in, prayed, fasted, trusted God and have continued to do an incredible work and even doing more now than they've ever done before. He's the founder of Eastwood Anaba Ministries. He's known, anybody that knows Eastwood Anaba knows he's a revivalist with a message of restoration and with a message of really the power of the Holy Ghost. As my wife mentioned, he's written 93 books. And he truly operates as the book of Acts apostles. There's many, many things that are responsibilities that he has, but he has been able to commit himself to fasting, to prayer, to the study of the word, to the writing of great books that have truly transformed lives. And when he begins to operate and begins to flow in the spirit, those of you that were here Friday can testify, you felt something besides a man's hand touch your head. There's a fire of God that is within him. And we thank God for his ministry. We thank God for his faithfulness. And we pray that you're not just, you're here today. But if you're watching online and you're here today, let's make sure we're back here tonight at 6 o'clock because there's no telling what's going to happen in the house tonight. I want you all over this house to welcome our friend from Bogotonga, West Africa. I want you to welcome him. Bishop Eastwood Anaba. Praise God. Lift up your hands to Jesus today. And I want you to worship him, give him glory. Somebody just thank God and bless him for his word that is coming. And you want to pray that the Lord will give unto you the grace to overcome every hindrance in your spirit to be able to receive the word of God. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We give you all praise and glory because you are worthy. We ask that the word of God will work a work in the lives of your people and your holy name will be glorified. Amen. You may be seated and God bless. Well, we want to thank God for this morning. My wife came together with me, Rosemont, and I want to thank her for just moving all over these places with me. It's, it's, not, it's not easy to just get up from Ghana and start moving all over the world with your husband who never stops. But um, we realized we hadn't seen Pastor Bagwell and Lady Gala for a long time, and we we're like, let's go look for them. So um, our real aim for coming to Denver this time was just to come and visit Pastor and Lady Gala. That was all the reason for which we wanted to come. But 
I'm preaching to you was a coincidence. And we pray that the coincidence will become a prophecy. You know, there, there are times you, there are times you, you, you didn't intend something. We, we would have just flown into town, just seen them say hello to them, and then we are off. And that is because we have, we have very few friends like them in the world. Not very few. Our Pastor Bagwell and Lady Gela are just one. They, they, they are the only friends we have like that in the world. And um, they may not realize it. We know so many people. We travel a lot. But that level of the relationship, that personal connection, we, we are talking about black and white. You know, is, 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 they are the only ones who are like that with us in terms of ministry at this level. Um, we, we know many people, but it's not like that. It's not, it's not at that level. Now, I remember there was a time I was in Columbus, and I went to Pastor Rod Parsley's mom, um, Mother Parsley, who is um, late now. She took me for some breakfast, and um, my wife was not with me on that trip, and we, we took a picture together, my, Mother Parsley and I. She would always take pictures in a way. And she would give you hugs and kiss you all over the place. You get embarrassed because she, she treats you like you are 15-year-old. And um, when I get there, they say, well, her African son is here. So she, she took me. We took this picture. I sent it to my wife. And, you know, taking a picture with Mother Parsley with my color, the picture looked like light and darkness. So I sent this picture to my wife. And I said, Pearl, look at this picture, light and darkness. But, but we, were, we were on the same picture, and it was nice. But coming back to Pastor Bagwell and Lady Gayla, we, we, we bond together with them very well. Pastor Bagwell was with us as far as Bogatanga. As far as Bogatanga. Not, few, not many people go there. Um, even Ghanaians who live in Ghana, if you told them at the capital city of Accra, go to Bogatanga, they are like, no. That is a God-forsaken land. We are not going. And um, Pastor came all the way, and Lady Gayla released him to come. And um, so we are like, you know, these friends of ours relate very well. We want to go see them. And we came. We've had a nice time with them. Um, we, yesterday, they took us to a restaurant, and um, everything on the menu was Greek and Hebrew. In other words, I couldn't, I couldn't understand a word. And when they asked me what I'm going to eat, I said, look, there's no banku here, no fufu. You know, we, we eat some things in Ghana, banku, fufu, and, and if you want another word, it's called dankwasere. You know, we, we know things like that, you know, so. <laughs> you know, um, being an American is different from being an African. So, um, for example, Pastor Gela and um, Pastor Bagwell were saying some things here, and you guys were laughing. I, I turned to my wife, I said, what are they laughing about? What are they saying? They should bring me Mr. Ibu and Osofia. You know, I'm sure when I say Mr. Ibu and Osofia, some of you are like, what is that? It's not a dish. It's, it's some comedians in Africa who, who, who do jokes and then we laugh. But what you guys were laughing at, uh, once in a while I smiled at nothing. I, I didn't understand it, but I had to smile, you know. <laughs> Somebody said, was that pretense? It wasn't pretense, it was moral support. I was just giving you guys moral support. You know? <laughs> but, but, but we are excited to be here. And I just pray that this morning, what I'm about to share will help you. But um, we have some books at the bookstand. This one is called 101 Treats of Initiators. The good thing about having a book is that even if you don't understand what everything the person is saying because of an accent, a book has no accent. English is English. So that, that is why it's important to read. It's important to read. It's, it's, it's important to read. And um, so this one is 101 Traits of Initiators, how you can initiate things and they would grow and become big and have an influence and impact on people. We have just about 10 copies of this. I have a book here called Jesus Christ and an Open Heaven. Jesus Christ and an Open Heaven. 
that one too, maybe about just 10 copies, I don't know. Then we have a few copies of this book called The Laying On Of Hands. The Laying On Of Hands is a doctrine. It's not just a cultural practice. It's a doctrine, one of the foundational doctrines of Christ. And you go to many of our churches, not only in Africa, not only in America, but also in Africa and the rest of the world, and the laying on of hands is becoming extinct. I believe in the laying on of hands. It's, it's a doctrine to me. Two weeks ago, I had a meeting in Accra, Ghana. The last night of the meeting, I laid hands on 11,000 people single-handed. I stood on my feet, and for two hours, I was touching 11,000 people. And I did it and finished and continued ministering for another about maybe two hours or so. My meetings can be very long, especially when I'm not in America. So don't, <laughs> don't panic. Um, if, I, if I did a meeting for two hours, it was a recreation or a time of react, relaxation. Um, normally, I would like to go in tents, especially if you want the Spirit of God to move I noticed something about the Holy Ghost. You can never hurry him. You can never push him. He's, he's never been pushed. No. So if Jesus will spend four days before he gets to Lazarus' home, it will be four days. Whether he's dead, he's decomposing, Jesus will not hurry. At the wedding feast of Canaan, he's not in a hurry. His mother came to him and said, the wine is finished. He said, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour is not yet. So for God, when it's not time, it's not time. And you have all these people who go to church and they try to push the Holy Spirit. And it's like, since when did you push God? Uzzah attempted to hold the ark. When it looked like the ark was falling, Uzzah tried to just touch it to keep it in position. He fell down and died. God said, no human has ever helped me, and you will not be the first. <laughs> and and, and I, I pray that between tonight and um, between now and tonight, something will happen to you. I, I just know that something will happen in this building. Amen. I just know that between now and 6 p.m., there will be a revolution in somebody's spirit. And the revolution will lead to an evolution of something that will last for years. I believe it. Now, on Friday night, I preached from this book called For This Purpose. And this night, I'll be speaking from here again. We brought just 64 copies. And I'm just believing God that we are not taking any of them away but you will just consume these books. Um, we just came from New York, we did a meeting, and um, over 500 to 600 of these books disappeared because people just bought them to read them. And I know you are better readers than the people in New York, so you, you will do better. Um, in your case, we brought not up to 100 books, so we shouldn't carry them away. But I have a book here I'm preaching from this morning, and unfortunately, we don't have the hard copies here. They all disappeared in New York. We had about 300 copies. All of them were sold out, so I couldn't get any copies to bring. I, I brought a copy to Pastor, but um, unfortunately for you, or fortunately for you, you will have to go on Amazon and find a soft copy and put it on your phone or your iPad or your computer. But it is called The Unclean Spirit with Purpose the unclean spirit with purpose. And I just went for one chapter of this book. That is the chapter six, wisdom from a demon. Somebody say wisdom from a demon. Now, there are many ways you can learn wisdom. And when you look in the Bible, the Bible tells us how you can get wisdom. And uh, the book of Proverbs will say, if you're a lazy man, go to the ant and learn wisdom from the ant an animal, a very small insect. Go to the animal kingdom, find the insect, and as a lazy person, you can learn wisdom from the ant. You go into the Bible in the New Testament, and Jesus is trying to teach on wisdom, and he goes and he talks about, you can learn wisdom from animals, and he said, be wise like a serpent, and be harmless like a dove. And he's trying to teach wisdom again, and he uses the unjust word, 
And he said, and the unjust steward behaved wisely because the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. But one of the most powerful teachings on wisdom Jesus gave was when he used a demon to teach believers and to teach his followers and disciples wisdom. And that takes us to Luke chapter, Luke chapter number 11. But before I get to Luke 11, let me speak about the fact that life is, um, life is controlled by people trying to have territorial dominance. Almost everywhere you go in the world, people want territorial dominance. So America wants to possess America. You come to your family, you want to possess your family. You go into the church, you need a certain territory for yourself. So somebody wants to, to dominate in the area of the choir. Somebody wants to dominate in the area of the ushering. Somebody wants to dominate in the prayer department. We just want to dominate in the area of business and, and politics and sports and entertainment and ministry. So you find people trying to have territorial control. And in the midst of trying to have territorial control, we try to outwit one another. We, we use all kinds of things to outwit one another and, and to exert power over one another. Sometimes we use atomic bombs. Sometimes we use our words. Then there are times we try to use wisdom. And so let's stay on wisdom, where wisdom becomes a weapon with which we try to win our wars. We use wisdom in our families. We use wisdom in the church. We use wisdom in business. We use wisdom to try to, to, try to control things. But the wisdom comes in two forms. Number one type of wisdom is when we use the wisdom that is of the earth and the wisdom that is divine. James, the apostle, picked on these words. And in James chapter 3 and the verse number 14, James is talking about wisdom. And James said in the verse number 14, But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Verse number 15, this wisdom descended not from above, but it is earthly, it is sensual, and devilish. So there's some kind of wisdom that is earthly, that kind of wisdom is sensual, and that kind of wisdom is devilish. Then he goes to the verse number 16, verse number 16, and he said, For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Verse 17 is the very interesting verse. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Verse number 18, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. He's talking about two kinds of wisdom. One day I remember I was talking to a pastor and the pastor told me, he said, Isod, you are too simple. You are too simple. And that is why many people take advantage of you. And then he added, he said, I think pastors should be more sophisticated. I've never forgotten those words. I told my wife later, I said, my friend said we should be sophisticated. But the wisdom I see in the Bible is not sophisticated wisdom. Jesus taught some kind of wisdom. If they slapped you on this cheek, turn the other. If they told you to go one mile, go two. If they picked up your coat, let them have your cloak. But we have a kingdom, the body of Christ today, that operates more with human Earthly, sensual, and devilish wisdom than divine wisdom. And Jesus is teaching wisdom, and in Luke chapter 11, he decided to use a demon to teach believers wisdom. Now let's look at wisdom from a demon. A wisdom, a, a demon that seems to have the kind of love Christians don't have. It has the sense of cooperation many believers don't have. 
Luke chapter 11, when the strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in place, are in peace. Verse number 22, let's go. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him, he overcomes him and takes away from him the armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. Verse number 23, he that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me is scattereth. Shall we stay on this? He that is not with me is against me and, and he that gathereth not scattereth. Is there a way we can pick up this particular verse in the message translation of the Bible? Just this one. Then I go back to the King James. The message translation of the Bible. Okay. Oh, I like that. Thank you very much. Thanks. This is war. There is no neutral ground. If you are not on my side, you are the enemy. And if you are not helping, you are making things worse. One of the problems in our churches is when we have members who are not doing anything. And when you ask them, they just tell you, I'm just a, a I'm just a casual member. I, 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 I just go to church there. Are you in the ushering? No. Are you an usher? No. Are you in the singing department? No. Are you in the protocol department? No. Are you in the technical department? No. Are you a prayer warrior in the church? No. Are you a deacon? No. I, I'm just a member. You are not just a member. This is war. You are either for or you are against. There is no neutral ground. And if you are not helping at all, you are making matters worse. The most dangerous people in the church are the people that look like squatters. They are like squatters. They, they are there. They have no license to be there. They, they have no reason. They, they have no purpose. They, they have no assignment. They have no mandate. They don't do anything. They just walk in and walk out. And you can look at them and they, they make up the numbers. So you can have a church of 3,000 people and the actual members are just about 100 because the rest of them are just there. So he said, there is no neutral ground. And he said, don't treat this thing like an act of tourism. It's an act of war. This is war. Fight it like you are dealing with the work of the enemy. It's not something that's casual. It's not something that is ordinary. So, let's go back to the King James Version of the Bible. He said, he that is not with me is against me, and he that is not, he that gathereth not with me is scattereth. So, some, somebody can be in the church, and it looks like the person is, is not a dangerous person. He, he just walks in and walks out. That's just a casual member. Nominal member. No. If you are not gathering, you are scattering. Verse number 24. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through the dry places, seeking rest. And finding none, he said, I will return to my house whence I came out. Verse 25 says, and then he comes and finds that the place is swept and garnished. I, I, I want to rush it because of time. Pe people, I see the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, as a body that has been cast out. Where the church is today is not where we used to be. The church was an anointed place. The body of Christ was a place of glory. If you want to know where the church is supposed to be situated in the spirit, go to Acts chapter 2 and go to Acts chapter 3 and go to Acts chapter 4 and you will see where the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to be the place where no man comes among us if he's not holy enough. That is why in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira will be slain to death because at that time, nothing unclean was supposed to mix up with the church. But today we have a church that is mixed. All kinds of people are in the church. Witches can feel comfortable in the church. Wizards can feel comfortable in the church. People with all kinds of negative spirits, dangerous elements, can sit in the church and they are comfortable because the whole thing has degenerated into a spirit of religion. And we sit in the church and everything is so religious, everything is so organized, everything is so secular, everything is so carnal. 
take entertainment out of the church and it doesn't exist today. But ladies and gentlemen, we are not the church we used to be. I call the church of Jesus Christ an evicted tenant. I call the church of Jesus Christ a group of people who have been driven out of their garden of Eden and they have left the place of glory. When I talk about the church, I'm talking about the time when in the days of old, if somebody said he was an apostle, his shadow will raise the cripple. If somebody said he was an apostle, handkerchiefs and aprons will be taken from the body and the sick will be healed. Those were the times when the glory of God was so powerful, anointing of God was so strong, the power of God, the presence of God was all over the place. I'm talking about a time in the church when they broke bread from house to house and their fellowship was unbreakable. The church was united. My Bible said they were all together with one heart and there was none that had anything that he called his own, but he had all things in common and the people that were, had houses or lands sold them and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet and distribution was made to every man such as he had need. I'm talking about the church of glory. The word of God was so powerful. When they spoke the word of God on one day, 3,000 souls were, were, were won to the gospel and to the church. The church was so powerful. It was a place of a revival. It was a place of holiness. But my Bible teaches me that the church we see today is not the church of that time. Today's church is so entertaining. It is so political. It is so secular. It is so intellectual that if you don't have intellectualism and you don't do anything that can move the emotions of people, your church is going to be empty. But the Bible said the demon went about from dry place to dry place, seeking rest and finding none. The church is moving through our dry places at this time. We are moving through dry places. Our worship is dry. Our, our prayer is dry. Our service is dry. Our fellowship is dry. When we preach the word of God, it is dry and we are looking for rest and you can never find rest in dry places. Even this demon knew that this is dry, that is dry, that is dry. The demon was fastidious. The demon had a taste. But here we are with Christians who don't even know what a dry place is. They don't know what a good church is. When they go to a church that has entertainment, they say, wow, this is a great church. When they go to a church that has backsliding and a church that has forgotten the ways of God and the word of God is not even pure, they will crowd the place, the place will be full. So you will go into settings where churches that are powerful are empty and churches that don't have the grace of God are very full and that is because the believers have lost their direction. They don't know what is dry anymore. But this demon went to a place, he said, no, this place is dry. I'm not staying here. This place is dry. I'm looking for rest. And the rest is looking for a spiritual rest. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no point in sitting in a church where you are getting physical rest and you are getting entertainment and you are getting something that is secular. But spiritually you get nothing out of that place. The demon said, I want rest for my soul. I will go back to my house from whence I was cast out. I pray in Jesus name. May you go back to where you belong. The Bible said, therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return. They shall come again unto Zion. Everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning and weeping shall flee away. I see you go back. I'm talking to many believers today who are not what you used to be. You used to be prayerful. You used to be worshipful. You used to be the kind who would give an offering. You used to be the kind who would serve in a department. Today you are standing on the sides and you are just looking at everybody moving the kingdom. Your spirit is dry. Your soul is dry. You can't pray anymore. You can't worship anymore. You don't want to go to a prayer meeting. But I see you like the prodigal son who the Bible said when he came to himself, he said I will arise and I will go to my father's house. I see somebody. You will arise. You will return to your house from which you came out. The Bible said the unclean spirit in the verse number 25 came and found out that the house was swept and it was garnished. I bring to you a prophecy. The church of God we are being in the dry places. We've been in Babylon. We've been in Egypt. We've been in the land of the Philistines. But I have news for you. The church is coming back. The kingdom of God is coming back. Anything 
you lost is coming back. Anything that left your hand is coming back. Any glory you lost is coming back. Listen to me. Your family is coming back. Your prayer life is coming back. Your worship is coming back. Your anointing is coming back. Your glory is coming back. The power of God is coming back. And listen, when you go back, you will find the place swept and you will find the place garnished. I can tell you the latter days of the church that the church will be swept. That means all the dead will be brushed off and the church will be garnished. And that word garnished means that the place will be adorned, the place will be trimmed, the place will be put in order. That is what you are going back to meet. I see you go back. Your business is going back. Your ministry is going back. Your anointing is going back. Am I talking to somebody who is going back? Am I talking to somebody who will not stay in the dry place forever? Even the demon did not stay in the dry place forever. And if demons did not stay in the dry place forever, you will not stay in the dry place forever. I see your return. I prophesy your return. I call for your return. And I speak to any principality, any power that is holding you in the dry places. I say to the north, give up. I say to the east, give up. I say to the west, give up. And I say to the south, give up. Let the redeemed of the Lord return. Let them come to their place of glory. Let them come to their place of power. I see you going back. I see you on your knees again praying. I see you on your knees again worshiping. I see you in your place of ministry. Come on, clap your hands and scream like I'm talking to you this morning. Now watch this. The unclean spirit came back and he found the place, verse number 25, swept and garnished. That means whilst it was in the dry places, somebody came and swept the place. Somebody came and garnished the place. Even the unclean spirit experienced the grace of God. It came to inherit what it didn't work for. What it didn't sow. What it didn't do. You know what, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes you think the results you are going to obtain will come from your own effort. That is why you try this, you try this, you try this, you try this. But I read my Bible and he said, except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. And except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wicked but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and sit up late to eat the bread of sorrow. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. This demon was away. And whilst it was away, somebody was sweeping. Whilst it was away, somebody was garnishing. Ladies and gentlemen, whilst you were away, Somebody is putting your money in place. Somebody is putting your house in order. Somebody is blessing you. Listen to me. You are about to go to a place you didn't labor. And when you go back, what you were looking for, somebody will put it there for you. I see an act of grace bringing you a blessing in the name of Jesus. Now the verse number 26 says, And when he came and found the place swept and garnished. This is where the wisdom comes in. For many people... If they come and they see the place is swept and garnished, they will just dwell there alone. But the unclean spirit said, I'm not going to stay here alone. Because if I dwell here alone, the one who cast me out will come back and will cast me out. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go and take seven other spirits more wicked than myself, so that we will enter in and dwell in this man, and the last state of the man will be worse than the first. This is where the wisdom comes in. That when you see a place that is swept and garnished, you don't dwell there alone. You go and you bring in others. We have a problem in the kingdom of God and in the church right now. Some of the places are swept. Some of the places are garnished. But our problem is this. When we see the place that is swept, thank you, Pastor. When we see the place that is swept and garnished, many times we just want to dwell there alone. Excuse me to come closer to you because that will help. <laughs> there, are, there are weapons you shoot best when you are standing there, and there are close range missiles. 
them come closer. When we find a blessing, many times we are so greedy, we want to enjoy it alone. This demon comes, he sees a place that is swept and garnished, and he said, I will not dwell here alone. I want to go bring some other spirits, more wicked than myself, so that we can control this territory for a long time. When you see a good thing and you enjoy it alone, it will be short-lived because you will not last. If you want to be in the choir alone, you will not last. You want to be in the ushering alone, you will not last. You want to be in Denver alone, you will not last. The more we are, the better. Because two are always better than one. A demon knew that. Now, if you want to understand the mentality and the philosophy of this demon, you will have to go to Isaiah chapter 11. And in Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah is seeing the imagery of the, he's seeing an imagery of the seat of the Messiah, where the Messiah is going to rule on Mount Zion, and he looks at the imagery, and he said, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf, the young lion, the fatling, together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed, and their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And he said, the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. That is how a black man and a white man, it can work. That is why in a church, you can stay in a church and Democrat and Republic, Republican can be in the church. Conservatives and so-called liberals can be in the church. Now, you know, we are talking about a situation that looks like the Ark of the Covenant. Sorry, the Ark of Noah. Where he brought in these animals and the clean animals were there, the unclean animals were there. You are talking about wolves. You are talking about lions. You are talking about leopards. You are talking about snakes. And on that same mountain, there are children calves, lambs, and they are not destroying one another. But look at our families. Two Christians cannot marry. They will tear each other up and stand in front of heeding and unbelieving judges to judge their matter. Churches are in court with one another. Believers cannot dwell together. Believers cannot dwell together. Our assemblies are full of gossip, destruction. We destroy one another. Pastors bring down one another. When a pastor is going through a lean season, it is other pastors that will exacerbate the situation. They will make it worse. But I see the church, we will come to a place. Wisdom will come in. Heavenly wisdom will come in. A time is coming. Look at this mountain. Look at this mountain. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. But I thought, that if, put, if you put a, a, a lamb within the vicinity of a wolf, the wolf is supposed to take up this lamb and use it for breakfast or lunch or dinner. But the wolf sees the lamb and the wolf says, buddy, how are you? It's good to see you on this mountain. The leopard sees the kid and the leopard is like, how are you? Cannibals and carnivorous animals have lost their carnivorous instincts and they are now, watch this, they are now even eating herbs just like the herbivorous beings. So the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. Now people, when you, when you, when you look at this, this thing, dwelling together, dwelling together, dwelling together, I'm just talking about animals. Animals. There are many of you here, some of you here. This, the, the pew you are sitting on, if they brought another member of this same church to come and sit on that pew, you would vacate the pew. 
You can't do well together with them. Our choirs are breaking up. Ushering departments are breaking up. The fellowship is not what it's supposed to be. But behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head. And he said, for there he commanded the blessing. It amazes me when believers can't marry. It amazes me when they can't stay in the same ministry. It amazes me when two successful ministries cannot be in the same city. It amazes me when Christian businesses cannot, cannot dwell together and make impact together. Now, the reason why dwelling together becomes a problem is because Isaiah talked about it. He said, number one, if you brought believers to dwell together, there will be a problem with leadership. Who will be the leader? Now, as soon as you bring five Christians together, or five pastors, the question is, who's going to be the head? Who will be the bishop, and who will be the archbishop, and who is going to be the head of all of us? The other day, I saw that there was a little flyer to advertise this event, and I saw my picture was very big from Africa. Very big picture. And I saw Pastor Bagwell and Pastor Gilles' pictures. Very small in the corner. And I said, hmm, this can only happen with Pastor Bagwell. Only, only a humble man of God can do this. If it was another church, the, the bishop of this cathedral, his picture will be like a cloud. And my picture will be like a little ant that is coming from Africa to walk about in America. You know, I looked at it and I'm like, wow, it's likely that in Africa this won't happen. You see many of our flyers when we are going to speak. Somebody's picture is very big. Another is small. And I'm like, are you doing a picture contest? A head competition? For God's sake, it is all about preaching. It is about the ministry. It is not about images and pastors. And pastor, thank you for showing the way. Lady Gela, thank you for showing the way. When you put believers together, the first thing they want to ask is, who is going to be the leader? But Isaiah said, the cow and the bear. Oh no, I want the verse number six. The verse number six. The wolf shall dwell with the lamp and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf. The young lion, the fatling, together, and a little child shall lead them. In other words, when it comes to leading, it is not how big you are. You could be a little child and be the leader. You could be a little child and be the leader. You know what? In a family, the, the man is supposed to be the, the, the head of the family, but there's a time you may have to allow a woman to take some decisions. In the church, an associate pastor can show the way. A little child will be the leader. Believers cannot dwell together because everybody wants to be the leader. So you cannot put, any, you cannot put pastors together to form a ministerial fellowship. Know who is going to be the head. Apart from leading problem, there is the feeding issue. So he goes on and say, and in the verse number seven, the verse number seven, he said, the cow and the bear shall feed and their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the, like the ox. You know, so on this mountain, there is enough food for the lion, enough food for the leopard, enough food for the bear, enough food for children, enough food for lambs. You know, you know what? That demon went and the place was swept and garnished. It means everything they needed was there. People, listen to me. The earth is the laws and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. I believe this one thing. That you know what? It doesn't matter how many churches are in a city. Your members are your members. They will not go anywhere. They will be with you. 
what God has given to you, nobody can ever take them away from you. And I pray in the name of Jesus. You know what? You don't have to destroy my work in order to be successful. You don't have to bring down my church in order to build one. Because you know what? We all have more than enough. The cow and the bear shall feed. You don't have to pull me down in order to have your space. You can succeed and I can succeed. Listen, when my body was growing up, my arms did not have to starve my feet in order to grow. My arms did not take up the energy of my feet. Let me show you what will happen. If your head decided to take all the nutrients that belong to your feet so that your head will become bigger, by the time the head is bigger, the legs will be so small, you have a condition of sickness called hydrocephalus. That means your head is bigger and it's out of proportion. Your legs have now become so weak, they cannot carry the head, and that head will not drop on the ground and roll about like a pumpkin. There is no wisdom in starving me in order to be bigger. Because when you starve me to become bigger, you have become bigger, but I'm supposed to carry you, and I will not have the strength to carry you. Allow me to be big whilst you are growing big so that I can support you. My neck had to grow big with my head so that the neck could support Head. That is the way a body operates. But look at us. I want to feed, but I want you to starve. I want to have the money, but I want you to be broke. I want to be anointed, but I want you to be disgraced. I want to have honor and fame and become popular, but I want to, I want to denigrate you. I want to bring you to the ground. I want to abuse you and take everything you've ever labored for from you. You cannot grow at my expense. You shouldn't grow at my expense. And you will not grow at my expense. Because you know what, people? There is a law of justice in the world. Am I talking to somebody at all? You are talking about feeding. The fact that you want to build your business doesn't mean you should break mine down. The wolf the cow and the bear shall feed. The bear is supposed to be a carnivorous animal. And it's and supposed to just um, eat up the, the cow. But the bear said, you know what? There's more than enough for all of us. Just eat what you want to eat. I will eat what I want to eat. And the lion got to the ox. And the ox was feeding. And the lion said, I'm the king of the jungle but I'm going to humble myself and, and I'm going to eat exactly what you eat. May the Lord bring us to a place where we are not fighting over who will lead. What will this person eat and what will that person eat? There's more than enough money in the system. You don't have to betray somebody and destroy somebody's business in order for your business to grow. I hope you are understanding what I'm saying. So this unclean spirit, the unclean spirit went out, looked for, it came, it found the place, swept and garnished, and he said, I'm going to bring seven demons who are more dangerous than myself, and we're coming to stay in the place. Let's go back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter, I did verse 7, I did let me now pick up verse 8. And the ch sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the wind child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. Now, so I talked about when they dwell, dwell together, there is the issue of leading, then there's the issue of feeding, and number three, there is the issue of playing. Playing. There are times my wife will talk about my long legs. And when I see any short man in town, I say, Pearl, here is your uncle. Here is your uncle. Have you seen your uncle? And then she sees a tall man and she's like, hi, your brother is here. <laughs> now, so we, we play. You go among unbelievers, they play. Go to the nightclubs, they play. Go among witches and wizards, they play. 
In the church, we cannot play. We can't play. L- listen, in many of our churches, you cannot share a joke with somebody. The person will be offended and stop coming to church. Oh, in the world, I hear it all the time. That guy is just stupid. Then they call somebody and say, Michael, do, uh, Peter, James, John, do you know what you did was stupid? And he said, anyway, never mind. Next time, I'll correct that. In the church. You tell somebody you are stupid and see. The person will never be in church again. Even the people that work with us, Pastor Bagwell, you cannot correct them. You cannot tell them you did this thing wrong and never do it anymore. They will get offended. They will stop coming to church. But the Bible said on this mountain, sucking children are playing on the hole of the asp. The asp is the Egyptian cobra and the cockatrice is the horned viper. Children are playing on the hole of snakes. Can I play with you a little bit and you will not get offended? In our churches, you cannot meet a lady and say, today you look pretty. She would go and tell her friends, he has a crush on me. (laughs) But when I look at you, are you crushable? I was just trying to make you a, I was just trying to make a compliment to let you feel good a little bit. Because when I saw you, you needed a compliment. And you've turned my compliment into sexual harassment. In a lot of our, listen, in our churches today, if you are a widow, you are finished. You cannot go near somebody's husband. Honey, I'm not really comfortable. The way she called you about two times. I know she's a widow, but you didn't make her a widow. Nonsense. The devil made her a widow, fine. But shouldn't she get the support of her brother? In our churches today, there can be no joke whatsoever. You can't play with anybody. Somebody can dress up. The colors look so strange. Like the American flag or the Zimbabwean or Ghanaian flag. And you cannot tell the person, I think next time maybe pick up your combinations better. Because if you did it, the person will stop coming to church. So we have to leave you alone. Today you look like the Namibian flag. The, the next day you look like the, the American flag. The next day you look like the British flag. So you have become a flag all over the place. You have become multinational. Because nobody can correct you. We look at you. Your dressing. Does it match? We can't say anything. You put on a cap or a wig. I don't know whether you call it wig or cap. And this wig looks like an umbrella. And nobody can tell you that your wig looks like an umbrella. So you come to church every Sunday carrying an umbrella and nobody can tell you because you will get offended and leave the church. You put on your lipstick. The lipstick is so disproportionately applied that you, you look like the, 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 the light of a car. You know, the, the light of the car, that, that, that part that looks red, you just appear, boom, and nobody can tell you. Nobody can tell you. The man puts on a tie, and it is longer than President Trump's tie. Excuse me, that example. But I love your president's tie. I mean, it comes way down, and I'm like, only President Trump can get away with this. (laughs) And you cannot tell the brother, please, next time, just adjust this thing upwards. (laughs) You know, just take it, just take it upwards, (laughs) you know. But, but you know, you, you, you can't. We cannot share jokes in the church. But I look at a mountain where children are playing with snakes. Children are playing with snakes. In our families, you can't. In our churches, you cannot. In our businesses, you can't. Now, the demon, let's go back to our professor, the demon. 
I call this demon a professor because it is teaching us a lesson we don't know as believers. Luke 11 and the verse number 26. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. Now, now he's taking seven spirits more wicked than himself and they enter in and they dwell in this demon. Now, let's look at the issue of the leading. If it brings in seven demons more wicked than himself, who is going to be the leader? He was the original tenant in the place. He's now brought seven demons who are more wicked. And that word wicked means seven demons who are more harmful, more evil, and more calamitous. Now it has brought in seven demons who are more calamitous. It means they have more authority, they have more power, they are more dangerous, and they are likely to start leading. And this demon is saying, you know what? I brought you here but you can be the leaders. I will just serve. I will just mop up the floor. I will just do the dishes. I will do the ironing. I will be the one running the errands. Just lead. Can we get to the place where we are not contending for positions, but we are contending for the kingdom of God? And we are saying, it doesn't matter what I am. Even if I'm the servant, let the thing go on. You know what, people? So we have a system where weak people are leading us, and we are losing everything. So you know what he said? I'm going to look for seven demons who are more wicked. But look at you. The only friends you can bring around you are friends who are weaker than you. Less intelligent than you. You would never allow anybody who is more intelligent than you, more anointed than you, to be in your space. Because you are afraid. You are so insecure. But this one says, I'm not insecure. I'm bringing in spirits that are more wicked than me. When we leave this place today, may God give you the grace and the humility to bring around you people that are stronger than you, people that are wiser than you, people that are more anointed than you, people that are holier than you, people that are more prayerful than you. That is the only way we can go forward. You can only go forward when you bring people that are more. This one brought in demons that were more wicked. You will bring in people that are more intelligent, more prosperous, more holy, more prayerful, more anointed, more graced. Listen, may people that come into your life after today be bigger than you, stronger than you, more anointed than you, so that they can lift you up. Can I hear you clap like I'm, I'm preaching to you? And I prophesy, let me not get to that prophecy quickly. I'll get to that prophecy in just five minutes, and I'll be bringing this service to an end. Who will lead? The demon said, I must bring in demons that are more wicked, because if I bring in weaker demons, they will soon drive me away. I want demons that are better than me, sharper. We need people in the kingdom that are sharper. I got to a place in my ministry. I didn't know what to do. Pastor Bagwe, I didn't know what to do. At a certain stage in my ministry, about 10 years ago, I didn't know what to do. And this woman, Janet Annan, appeared all over. All of a sudden, from America, speaking this American English. And I'm like, who is this American who is trying to intimidate me? And she comes into the place. No, Papa, this cannot be there. Papa, let's move this one. Papa, let's shift this. Within about three years, by the grace of God, God had used this woman to give our ministry an international flavor. She brought me all the way to Denver. She said, you know what, Papa? Let's br I'm bringing you to Denver to hold a little party. Just get some people together so we can just honor you a bit. At that time, TK, I didn't know what honor was. Because I had served people who never stopped to even say thank you. And thank you, Janet. And then she put me together with Pastor Bagwell. Pastor Bagwell brought me here, gave me a certain other dimension and exposure of ministry. Ladies and gentlemen, you must get to a pl place where God brings into your life people that have what you don't have. When they come, they will make you better. They will not reduce you. They will raise you up. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Naganamba Lunkika, Iki 
Yamba Luce Brando Rike. I pray for every business. I pray for every family. I pray for every ministry. May God bring to you people that are more. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, let me bring people that are more wicked. You know what? Somebody has to come into your life who has the money you don't have. May God bring back your but you know what, Pastor, 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 Pastor Bagwe? Rich people sometimes cannot come into our churches. Because as soon as the person comes and you give the person attention for even two weeks, the members go like, well, Pastor relates only to the rich people. The poor people, he doesn't come close to us. Envy. Greed. Babies who are refusing to grow. You know what, people? If somebody got in here right now with a certain kind of intellectual status, the person would intimidate us. If somebody came here with a certain kind of anointing and Pastor Bagwell just gave the person a little exposure, it will shock you. People within the church will find the anointing because somebody will feel threatened. The demon said, I'm not threatened at all. I'm bringing in seven demons who are more. Until you get people around you who have what you don't have, you will never be where you should be. If you can clap, your blessing is happening. In the name of Jesus. The demon, listen, this is a demon. This is a demon. It's not a Christian. It's not the Holy Spirit. It has no word of God. It's a demon with this amount of common sense. And the demon said, I'm bringing in seven demons more wicked. Now, if they are more wicked, they are likely to have more appetite for food. They are likely to eat more. So he said, let them come in. Let them eat all they can eat. So they may bring in somebody to work with the ministry. You've been there for 10 years. And they'll give the person a bigger salary than you. He said, yeah, I'll let it happen. As long as this person can take us where we are going, let him have the salary. Because by the time he takes us where we are going, I will then receive more salary. Am I talking to somebody at all? So he said, let them eat. Let, let them eat. Because you see, if I don't bring in these seven people, our purpose will never be accomplished. He said, my mission is not to lead. My mission is not to feed. My mission is to destroy this man. So I'm bringing in seven demons that can help me destroy the man. And it's not about leading and feeding. For this purpose, I will humble myself. For this purpose, I will make myself of no reputation. My Bible said, let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, taught it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name that is higher than every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things that are on earth, of things that are on earth, of things that are in heaven, of things that are on earth, and of things that are under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I see a demon, and the demon is saying, I, 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 I don't mind if I starve. I don't mind if I eat the crumbs. My purpose is that this man should be destroyed. They asked him, are you not going to eat? He said, just eat and do the job. I don't mind if I starve. But look at us. Look at us. Greed. We fight over the food. We've forgotten about the purpose. We don't even know why we exist. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And when he knew his purpose, and God the Father told him, you must become a human. He said, I am God. 
I am the equal with God the Father. I'm equal with God the Son. But I will become a man so that the mission will be accomplished. What are you prepared to sacrifice? What are you prepared to give up? Here you are. You don't want to give up a position. You don't want to give up food. You don't want to give up money. You don't want to give up your entitlements. But you want to go where you want to go. You will never get there. Never. Never get there. Oh, I'm talking about playing. Talking about playing. Demons know how to play. Go to the nightclub, you will see it. They play. Come to the church. You can't even play. I've seen unbelieving marriages that are more entertaining than Christians married. Everything about us is boring. Everything is boring. Everything is stiff. We are like people who are not going to heaven, but people who are going to hell. Because sometimes when we look at where we are going, we should be able to tell by how you go there. Watch people that are going to play a, watch a basketball match. They are so happy going there. And when you look at them, you know they are going to match. They are going to watch a, a soccer match or a, a basketball contest because the way they are walking and the way they are so excited and they are wearing their, their, their team colors, you can tell they are going to a, 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 a sports event. When you see other people that are going to Afghanistan to fight a war, when you look at them, you can tell. Everybody's thinking about whether they are going to die or live. You can tell. When you look at the believers, our posture, our demeanor, you would think we are going to hell, not heaven. We look so stiff, so frustrated, so confused, you would think we are going to hell, not heaven. May your way of walk show the heaven you are going to in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Play it. I want to finish this scripture this way. Then goeth he and taketh unto him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. I want to prophesy on somebody's life that from today an anointing is coming upon you. I call it the drawing anointing. This demon went and took. It is a magnetic power. It is a power of attraction. I don't know what this demon told seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they followed him. What are you going to tell seven demons who are more wicked than you to follow you? But he did it. And after today, you are going to carry an anointing. Give me Revelation chapter 21, Revelation 12, my last scripture. Revelation 12 from verse number one. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Everybody stand to your feet. Everybody stand to your feet. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, traveling in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them upon the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. The dragon had a purpose, and in order to fulfill the purpose, it drew one third of the angels of God. One third of the stars of God. The, 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 the dragon drew. The unclean spirit drew. Seven spirits more wicked than itself. I'm praying today that when we leave this place, may you draw. And I pray upon word of life, church. I pray upon Dr. Bagwell, Lady Gela, all of you. May you begin to draw. And after today, when you draw people, may they be people that are higher than you, bigger than you, more anointed than you, holier than you, more prayerful than you, more prosperous than you are. Lift up your hand and pray. Draw. May you draw. May you draw. May you draw. Kadabashi.
Don't leave the building until Pastor Bagwell says leave. I will not keep you too long this morning because we are coming back in the night. And in the night, I'm going to lay hands on you and pray for you again. Tarabose. Come on, lift up your hand and pray. We want to draw. And I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, let the magnetic power, the power for drawing, let it come upon this church. Pastor Bagwell is a prophetic voice. A revival is coming. May God bring people into this church that will spearhead the revival. This is a man of God that is anointed, a man of God that is empowered, goes to places like Brazil and things are happening. I pray in America, the word that is dropping out of his mouth and the power that exudes and flows from his hand, many people will come into this building and that power will touch them. I pray in the name of Jesus. Come on, pray. My friend, Pastor Dragon, can you kindly get me um, some, some oil in my hand? Somebody pray. If you are an elder and a leader in this church, can you stand in front of me? Just lift up your hand while you are praying. If you are an elder or a leader in this church, just stand in front of me. Elder, leader, deacon, I don't know what name to use. Just stand in front of me. And I want to use you as a point of contact and pray that the anointing on your life will begin to draw. Ayakashi. Somebody pray. Is my song ready? Before I took, before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Can we go back, maybe two steps backwards? Yeah, 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 yeah. Lift up your hands. This song make, makes me think I'm in Ghana or something. Lift up your hands and pray. You have been so, so good to me. Before I take a breath, you breathe your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found. He's not enough. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, Your fault, still your love for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Sing it out, say, oh.
No war you won't kick down. Lie you will tear down. Come and have me. Come on, come on. No shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Come and have me. Nobody here today who will not be saying, Father, bring me back to where I used to be. The way I used to pray, the way I used to fast, the way I used to worship, the way I used to be on fire. So you know what? But there are things that hold us back. There are things that hold us back. I want for three minutes, we are going to be singing. You know, a song is a prayer. That is why the Psalms are prayers. The song is a prayer. We are going to pray. So stay on these lines. No shadow you will light up. Mountain you will climb up. Coming after me. No wall you will kick down. Lie you will stay down. Coming after me. Now listen. You see. There are, there are shadows, man of God. There are shadows that, that, that keep people from coming to us. There are shadows that keep you from going where you belong to. There are mountains that stop you. But he will climb up the mountain and take you and send you where you belong. And if there is a wall that is standing between you and him, he will kick the wall down. And if there are lies that people have employed against you, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, he will condemn it. Listen, I don't know what is holding you back, but sing the song with you. Oh, yeah. Hold 
elders can go back the elders can go back now but there is anybody standing in the congregation who says brother Eastwood, where i am now it's not where I used to be spiritually, where I used to be emotionally, where I used to be financially. But today, I'm going back home. I'm going back to the place that I belong to. I used to come to church here. But somehow, for some reason, I backslid. I was sitting on the sides. But now, I want to come back home and be the person I used to be. If you are standing anywhere, and you are saying, Lord, put an anointing upon me. That anointing is taking me back home. Lord, put an anointing upon me so that by this anointing, I will draw people. I will draw people. I will draw people. I, I need the kind of people who will be around me and take me to the place that I belong. Come on here quickly. Stand to your feet. Lift up your hand. And I'm going to be laying hands on you right now. Together with Dr. Bagwell, we are going to lay hands on you and we are going to believe God today that the power of God will come upon you. And that oil is an anointing. Come on, let's go with the song.
shadow sing there's no shadow he won't light up sing it you won't climb up coming after me no wall you won't kick down lie you won't take it out coming after me oh there's no shadow you won't kick down I won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, Jesus. No shall you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Hey, no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. No wall you won't kick it out. Lie you won't tear it out. Coming after me. No shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. No wall you won't kick it out. Lie you won't tear it out. Coming after me. No shadow you will light up, mountain you will climb up, coming after me. No wall you will kick down, lie you will tear down, coming after me. No shadow you will light up, mountain you will climb up, coming after me. Say all you will kick down, lie you will tear down, coming after me. No shadow you will light up, mountain you will climb up, coming after me. No wall you will kick down, lie you will tear down, coming after me. No shadow you will Look at me, look at me, lift up your hand. The Bible said, then went he and took seven other spirits more wicked. Oh Jesus, you are about to pray a certain prayer. Pastor Bagwell keeps talking about I live in Bogatanga one of the places many people would not like to stay and the Lord told me when I was 20 years old he said go to Bogatanga and live there all your life he told me 20 years ago he told me when I was 20 that is about 39 years ago I'm still there and the conviction to be there is stronger than when I started but watch this. The reason I'm still there is not because I'm a superman. The reason is because when he gave me that assignment, he then brought into my life the kind of people who will help me to stay there. You need some help. The last part of this prayer is that you are lifting up your hand right now. And from today, 
every handshake you shake anybody anybody you draw into your life will be somebody who is more everybody say more you see that scripture said then went he and took seven other spirits more wicked you don't need more wicked you need more prayerful more holy more anointed more powerful more financially strong more wise as you lift up your hand today from today any hand you shake even if it's a casual handshake may your hand draw into your life somebody who is more some of us need somebody more financially strong some of us need somebody more anointed some of us need somebody wiser some of us need somebody more knowledgeable some of us need somebody who is more knowledgeable more loving but whoever has lifted up your hand may you receive somebody who is more lift up your hand more 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 come on lift up your hand more more father bring into my life somebody who is more more anointed more wise more graced more powerful tonight is a revival and impartation service revival and impartation service is going to be powerful the glory of god will fill this place but lift up your hand lift up your hand lift up your hand lift up your hand pray it father bring somebody into my life who has more than i have can you do this for me lift up your hand and pray bring somebody into my life more holy more prayerful more anointed stay with me on that more holy more prayerful more anointed more holy more prayerful more anointed bring them into my life bring them into my life more holy more prayerful more anointed more holy more prayerful more anointed and let these doors be open and let it happen secondly lift up your hand and pray this prayer lord bring somebody into my life more wise more knowledgeable more wise more knowledgeable more wise more knowledgeable with more counsel more wise more knowledgeable more counsel come on somebody pray lift up your hand the last time pray father bring me somebody financially more solid administratively more solid bring me somebody who has something i don't have in terms of resources the person has more resources than i have lift up your hand and pray somebody clap your hands today and lift up your hand and say this after me heavenly father come and say it heavenly father i'll receive the anointing to take and to bring into my life people individuals ministries organizations families and businesses that are more than i am i receive that grace in the name of jesus amen